I forget what the function is called in Slack it that lets me remove something that shouldn't be installed when a, another package is installed. So I have to remove the standard package for a netcat to install a different version. There isn't a, a function that uninstalls a package. It's just that the, um, so for example, if you look at a different one, in fact, if you just look at the uh, template, it's that when the package is installed. Oh no, yes, rather, that's what I was looking for. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, so this is a basically a backwards bit of logic because there's no there's no package there's no function that checks if a package is installed. I never thought that I'd need that, and <laughs> clearly haven't in all this time. So this yeah. is just a back to front thing. If it's not, it just does an OR operator rather than an AND operator. So it's just in inverse logic, but you can use that. Tell you what, just... let's kickstart this podcast. Okay. Hello and welcome to the Slackware Arm podcast. This is episode 28 of season three. My, my goodness, how far we've come. It's quite a few um, episodes actually, Brent. I know that I'm sure that everybody that watches this podcast uses an ad blocker on YouTube. I can't imagine <laughs> for one moment that any of you guys who are technically competent enough and interested enough to be running Slackware on the ARM platform, of all things, would not be using an ad blocker. That's what I reckon. I could be wrong. But that's <laughs> what I think. And yeah. so I thought to myself, I actually, there's no money being made from the podcast. It's just not, it's not what it's about. I, I thought perhaps I could disable the adverts for all of the videos because it's like, I'd rather people just watch them without adverts because I find adverts quite frustrating. <laughs> so yeah, I, I'd rather annoying. just just remove that because there's no money for me anyway. So I went to go and figure out how to do it. And the instructions that are on Google's website don't match the user interface. So it says you're supposed to click on monetization, but there's nothing there. So I don't really know. Oh, maybe maybe you can only do that if you've already got enough to, if you're already monetizing it. That makes sense, but it doesn't say. Yeah, you have to have a, um, an AdSense oh, account. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Oh, in order to disable them. So oh, I think the idea is that if you're a, a vendor and you want to sell your product, you don't want adverts popping in the middle of your own advert. Yeah. So I guess I guess that's what it's about. OK, well, I tried anyway, everyone, just to let you know. I tried that before. It's like a pain in the butt. They don't even pay out until you've got at least 20 bucks on on the video worth of ads. Oh, OK. Well, <laughs> and if you don't get a lot of hits, it takes forever. So. Yeah. Well, that's not what this this podcast it's about. It's all about just advertising the distribution of things that we're working on. Right? This episode is going to be focused on the Honeycomb LX2 because we, where are we? So for the last couple of years. Um, Call your doorbell <laughs> camera company and cancel the subscription. <laughs> Just, yeah. just what you wanted <laughs> just what i wanted yeah you, this, this is i mean you know as i said i really did try um <laughs> freaking ads that's funny <laughs> for the last couple of years brent has been working on integrating the honeycomb lx2 support into slackware arch 64 which means that there'll be an out it means that it'll be supported out of the box so in other words, there'll be an inst there's an installation guide and you know a path that you can follow that leads to a, you know where you can set up a sensible kind of hardware profile in terms of using the put terms of the storage RAM and that kind of stuff. So that's what he's been working on in the background with R and D. And then over the last couple of months, I've been sort of productizing that experimental uh, work and folding it into the distribution. So. Brent's done basically all of the work on this with, as a, with me just hacking on a few things, tidying it up and folding it in. 
And then we got to the point where the bootloader is now configured. So the bootloader being Grub in this case is now configured within the Slackware installer. And it, it works, right? Yeah, it doesn't have that reboot issue. It just, if you reboot it and cycle it, it pretty much just reboots and it's fine. But and, the, and the configuration from Grub is, it works, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so that part's complete. I thought that was done. That part's complete. And the next thing is we need a tool to flash the bootloader or firmware, as it's called in um, uh, by Solidron. Um, whatever, I mean, <laughs> the first the it's, firmware that is able like to boot. A, it's just like having EFI firmware for an x86, basically. Oh. So. Yeah, yeah. In, in our case, so this is the point actually, because inside of the distribution, I'm going to I'm going to call, and we'll look at this in this podcast. So I'm going to call the flashing tool. Uh, I'm calling it bootloader flash because that's what we're calling it on the uh, on the on the other hardware models. Even though it's not strictly bootloader, is it? It's, it is actually firmware. So it's it's a bit of a distinction from um, from just a basic boot well a bootloader uh, such as Uboot. But I'm good. I'm calling the same. I'm using the same naming. I'm calling it bootloader for because for, for all we really care about is a bootloader, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> We're just yeah. booting Slackware. We don't really care much. About. I just like it because it's handy to have the like boot menu. Yeah. And the firmware, in case you like trash your install. Oh, definitely. So. I I like having a nice. Firm, you know, a nice bootloader and um, firmware tool like that with a menu. I like that. It's kind of preferable to U-boot actually, but um, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> but that's cool. I, I'm, it's, I'm not too bothered about bootloaders. I mean, as soon as I don't play, apart from hacking on U-boot for <laughs> about like 15 years, um, you can convert <laughs> the Rock Pro to use UFI. <laughs> All the work. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> Well, no, actually, because I'm going to move the. Um, so at the moment, we, we're going. I, I think we'll get back to the main thread at some point. <laughs> um, where was I? So at the moment, you know the um, source is. Where is it? I've realised recently that when I type and talk, when I don't actually I haven't actually done this before, I tend to just get muddled up. <laughs> so if I, I can type and talk if it's something I've done, you know, a million times. Um, but at the moment, I'll just uh, find what I'm looking for. So I think it's in is it post install scripts. Oh, no, it's not. It's this one. Yeah. This is the one. That, yeah. So this is why originally when you sent me the the honeycomb or the grub configure script, you thought that it would run at the same point as this one does. Um, yeah. And I that but that meant. Oh, yeah. Well, that meant probably why it was missing the file system type in the grub menu. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And and also you, it needed some application. It needed additional dependencies in, within the installer environment, which you really don't need to because you can just wait till they're installed on the OS storage yes. and just run it from there instead. So there was so I've moved so I've moved all this stuff around or rather I yeah, for Grub it now the Grub configuration happens in the post installation phase. Whereas this for configuring U boot happens in the pre installation phase, which at the time made sense because when I was writing it, I was just trying to, I was just, there's so much code to write. I mean, all this is brand new code. It doesn't maybe mean really much, but it's all brand new and needed testing and loads of research into using parted in script mode and all sorts of stuff. So I was just like, right, I'm just going to make it work and it will go in here. This is the easiest place to put it. And it kind of made sense. And now it still makes sense, but not as much as <laughs> moving it. So what I'm going to do at some point is just grab all this stuff at the bottom and then move it to the post installation um, section and, and have a configure U boot because then it's in line with the, um, the Grub way of doing it. Yeah. But I don't want to do this at the moment because it's. Not yeah, I couldn't get the U boot firmware to work on the Honeycomb. It was like, you know, it would start up, but then it would always spit out an error after it oh. loaded something. I don't know. I don't know what, I can't remember what it was exactly now, but. Yeah, you said it was also those issues with it. You spent you've been quite a bit of time on that, didn't you? Yeah, I didn't, I wasted a lot of time working on that thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, fortunately though, at least we, at least we've um, gone the grub route, and we've got a new. We have now another reference example of how to use you know uh, for hardware models that need grub. Yeah. 
OK, um, back to the previous thread. So, um, yeah, so Brent's been working on this uh, for the last couple of years. We've um, folded all the support. Well, oh, yeah, actually, yeah, we folded all of the support in in all of the areas. So the operating system, initial RAM disk, the kernel. What else is there? Um, the installer, of course, bootloader, loads of other stuff. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll enumerate these at some point. I'm calling them the integration touch points. What I'm going to do is I'll go back for the Rock Pro 64 and the Pinebook Pro and the Raspberry Pi and create an integration touch points where basic. So basically the idea is when other people want to help, uh, you know, or, or want to join the project and make Slackware work on other machines and do it properly, the way that you integrate it, you need references. So the idea is, is that you'll be able to look at all of the ones we currently support and go, OK, OK, so I know I need this, I need that. Here's where to look. So basically it's like a map. Of, of, yeah. of where to look within the OS, and then you open the, the tools and the scripts and read the doc and read the code in line, and then everything is documented within the code, pretty much. Yeah, you won't That's have to struggle time. with the new hardware. Yeah, it's going to be so much easier um, with all the hard work done. So yeah, uh, we, we're almost we've kind of almost um, uh, uh, reached the end of this project with the Honeycomb LX2 integration. And I said that I would write the final piece of it, which is the uh, flashing tool to flash the firmware to the SPI flash, uh, because I've already written the one for the Rock Pro 64 or the RK3399. <laughs> and I know how to integrate it into the um, Slackware installer. So it's a lot easier for me to do it than for Brent. So I said I would write that. But before we do that, uh, if you're interested in the current status as of November 2023, uh, you can have a look at this episode where Brent walks through installing um, Slackware on the Honeycomb LX2. I, actually, you know, Brent, it was good. I'm glad that we made this, or rather you made this video, because I saw a couple of errors in the, in the video, just watching the video, and I I, I fixed it. <laughs> like, oh, couple, yeah. There was a couple <laughs> of things that popped out that I caught on the video. Um, yeah, so I just fixed it in the code, and it's all fixed now. <laughs> oh, sweet. So, um, oh, yeah, yeah, there was like a whole list of things I was doing manually after I oh. installed it. And right, yeah, that's how you do it, isn't it? Until, yeah. you can get it until you can get the pieces together. Um, so, yeah, if you're interested in it, have a look at there. Oh, by the way, I'm aware that I'm digressing all over the place, but <laughs> don't worry, it's all under <laughs> control. The, um, in, on the video, there was also, in fact, I wonder if we can find it. It was when... It was when you first booted it. It was. Oh look, <laughs> learn to play the piano. God. I'd love to. Well, I already do. I can already play the piano by ear. That's me it's... playing. I'm wearing a mask. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. So there's a part in the video where it can't load the C A M C W A M module. Where would it be? It'll be down here, wouldn't it? So it should be after here somewhere. Yeah, A C M the the I two C controller, whatever. It's it's the same thing. It's for the fan. Um, no, it wasn't that one. It was the oh. um, C double A M. What? Oh, well, well, that's that... a, that's for a battery C W. No, it was oh. C. Hold on. I think. Oh yeah, you had a dodgy because um. This USB is because the thumb drives in my crappy <laughs> USB hub. <laughs> Some of the ports are bad. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, if you buy some cheap stuff, they always break, don't they? Yeah. Oh, that's funny. I don't see, I don't see it anymore. Oh well. Well, maybe it was in the installer section where I saw oh, it. It's probably the installer. Uh, yeah. yeah. But you already had the installer running, so. Oh yeah. Or did you? Maybe you didn't actually. Is this the installer? Or is this, no, this is the. Uh... That's that's put in the installer there. Ah, oh, hold on. There, yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. There it is. Ah, so that's missing from the installer. Yeah. Okay. And that's part oh, of the crypto stuff on the processor, I believe, if I understand it right. OK, 
Okay. So is that then, I thought that the... Ah, okay. Do we actually need, well, yeah, I'm just going to add it in. So I don't really know a lot about it. I haven't really looked at it, like what the module does, but I just figured it should be included because the um, there's an area that gets um, ejected out while it's booting because it can't find that. Something about Cam Jr. cannot load or something like that. Okay. So. Okay, there we go. Don't know if that's all it needs, but we'll find out. And it'll, at least it will be in there now anyways. Actually, yeah. how big is that directory? It's hopefully not too big. Oh, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> Should, I mean, yeah, not too worry about that. We've already, um, what was it we, we, we lowered? Oh, yeah, we reduced the footprint of the uh, OS init RD a few months ago, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. So anyway, that's fine. Could always thin this down later. Good, right, so there we go. Another problem solved. So yes, if you're interested in <laughs> what was the current state uh, a couple of months ago, watch this video and you'll see how, and you'll see how uh, Slackware will be installed. But, um, so what Brent's been working on apart from, or in addition to the sort of hacking element of it, is he's also been creating these beautiful instructions. So I looked at these the other day and I was like, oh, because the last time I saw them, they were just kind of some text all banged together. And and then I saw the then I see, saw this uh, the progress yeah. here. It's really nice. Thanks. Yeah. From so the that, olden days when I wrote documentation for a job. <laughs> yeah, I can see. It's it's really well written. <laughs> Thanks. I re really appreciate this. It's good. Yeah. So 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 my plan um, is that. Uh, um, is that I've already bought the case for the pine for the um, uh, honeycomb LX2. I've already bought the RAM. I just haven't yet bought the machine itself because it's quite expensive. But so that's going to happen. I'm just waiting to, <laughs> to be able to buy it. And yeah, I was on a very low budget. You could probably get some better stuff than what I have on there, but. Uh, well, uh, the only thing I actually need is the machine itself because I've already got the RAM. Yeah, and I've already and got you the have all the hard drives and. Yeah, stuff. I, don't, I don't need to buy those because I've got spares. I always have a couple of spares of um, storage stuff because the build machines do break every now and then, so I keep I carry yeah. spares. So I just use one of those. So really, the only thing I need is actually just the board itself at this point, and maybe and a new fan. Looks like we, a fan. it is missing the NVMe. Uh, M.2 uh, drive. I haven't put that in. I didn't. I don't have the hardware. Oh, okay. But it has an M.2 interface for oh. an NVMe drive. Oh, then I could but try I, because my Pinebook Pro, as you know, is currently yeah. bro broken. I can just use the NVMe from that. All right. Yeah. I, I have two different M.2 uh, NVMe's, and neither of them worked. Oh, okay. Including the one that I had inside the Pinebook Pro, so I don't know. Maybe you can figure that out. Oh, but okay. Maybe they're just incompatible. I don't know. Okay, well, I can look at that at some point. But could be a firmware bug. I don't know, but but so it does have four SATA ports already, so that's why I haven't really done anything about it. So well, my plan is to use the SATA. Yeah, that's that's my plan. So my so. Um, what I wanted to do, because I've never been in a position to do it before, because I'm the one who ported Slackware to the ARM platform, I've never been able to just go to it and go, oh yeah, I think I'll install it on a machine that you know that I've never that I've never touched before. Um, because, so I thought I can kind of get close to doing that because Brent's done really all the work here. So I'm going to buy the machine, and I want to be able to just follow the installation guide and just set it up from from scratch by you know from from day one i don't want to have to develop anything when, once i've got the machine so i want to be able to just you know get the machine plug it follow the guide plug it together boot it install it and it's done that's my plan they call, they call people like that moochers <laughs> moochers <laughs> moochers <laughs> ever heard that before i've heard the word but how does i don't really know what it means i'm not it's sure it's like that. people like piggybacking on somebody else <laughs> Ah. I don't know how to explain it. 
it's, well, it's well that, 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 that creates an infinite regress, though, because you're piggybacking on me and piggybacking on you. I know. That's, that's actually, it sounds quite, that sounds, I don't like the sound of that. <laughs> Lots of piggyback writing and it's, mooching going on. This doesn't sound good. Let's, let's, not, let's not talk about mooching, mooching, whatever it was you said. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't paint good images in my mind. Well, let's focus on the text. <laughs> <laughs> so those screenshots can be fixed up a little bit. I just kind of pulled them. Um, out of a screenshot window. Uh, okay. In KDE, point, yeah. I didn't like edit it too much. I just uh, cropped it from in GIMP. It looks fine so, to me, Brent. You can see yeah. it. I, would, I wouldn't worry about that. It looks, it looks good. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my plan is to uh, to follow this. So I'll, what, as I said, what I what I've said I'll do is I'll write the bootloader flashing tool. But just to recap how this works. So um the where is it so okay so right so as i understand the way the way that the installation guide is written or the the pro the, the procedure i should say is that so so okay let's take it back so i imagine i've got my new machine it's brand new the first thing I'm going to do is, is obviously plug it together, uh, plug in the storage and all of that stuff. The once I've done that, I'm going to um, because there shouldn't, there's probably not, there's no firmware in the SPI flash. I would assume. I'm sure it's empty. Yeah, right? Everything's blank when you get it. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, but even if it wasn't, I don't want to boot whatever they've got anyway. <laughs> so. Um, so, what okay, okay, but this is okay. So it's going to be blank, right? So, what the first thing I need to do is we need to get some. Uh, we need to boot the firmware from somewhere. So, what Brent's uh, set up here, the, the path is that you'll boot off of the SD card. So the system will find it will locate the S, the firmware on the SD card and boot it. So, what that means is that we effectively take we can't include well we could but it's really complicated we can't include the sd card as part of the os which is how we which is what we do on all the other hardware models well you can uh but i set that all up before the all-in-one installer so you oh, could yeah, this just is install... criticism. i'm just saying how it works yeah, yeah. <laughs> no no that's fine you you could you could do it but my point was is that because you'd boot it the sd cards slot it would be occupied and so we, we it's kind of like that that's that's fine it's um yeah i'm just kind of recapping for the benefit of the listeners oh yeah rather right. than you <laughs> and my understanding as well of how it works right yeah. so and the good thing is we actually don't want the sd card populate socket populated if we can particularly as part of the os because people prefer to be able to use it for storage however on the other hardware models the rock pro 64 etc we are occupying the we're, we're in Let's put it this way: the SD card is in scope of the operating system. That's where slash boot lives. You, you know, the boot um, the the, the uh, boot components of the OS live on there. So we've kind of we've included the uh, SD card as you know in part as part of the um, sort of operating system footprint, if you like. Um, but there's good reason for that. But I don't want to go into that at the moment. But on here, we've got the opportunity to not do it that way. So. We initially will boot off the SD card with this firmware on, and we will then install Slackware to the target storage. In this case, it's going to be SATA, or it could be any others, but we'll, we'll, we'll use SATA here. And then in the post installation phase, we need to, well, what we're going to do is we're going to um, flash a an appropriate version of the firm, yeah, an appropriate build of the firmware to your SPI flash, so that you once you reboot, or once you finish the installation, you can now reconfigure the machine with these dip switches to not boot from SD anymore, but boot from SPI first. So that way you free up the SD card slot for anything else you want. Um, and the SPI flash isn't really useful for anything but booting firmware anyway, <laughs> or containing firmware anyway. And so that way the system will boot the firmware from the SPI flash. It's all kept separate from the OS. It's all happy. And then the OS will boot. Basically, yeah. that's kind of that's kind of it. I don't know what their status is for more development. 
on the firmware, but huh. I, it's just been kind of sitting there for hmm. quite a while. They haven't uploaded anything new. No, I've noticed. So I think there's not going to be too much to change anymore with it. Exactly. So I'll yeah, let's talk about that in a minute because um, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about in this video. Um, okay. So to me, so this is a. So what I've done is I've created a um, a new directory inside the source, the Slackware ARM source tree in the A series. I've created this new directory to house the uh, bootloader flashing tool. So. Um, for example, the hard the Rock Pro 64 and Pineapple Pro version is here. So I've created a new one here, just, just using the templates and stuff. Um, the so yeah, everything is going to go in, into here. And I've created a spec file which basically talks through the scenarios that, that I need to handle. So the first the the first thing, the first scenario is it's a fresh install. There's nothing. So this, I'm thinking of my installation here. There's going to there's no there's nothing in the SPI uh, flash. There's no firmware there, but there would be an SD card present which would be flashed with one of the known versions of firmware that we're shipping with Slackware. So that should be what you that is what you've described. Yeah. Right. OK, so then. That's the first. Uh, scenario. The second one is that you're reinstalling Slackware, where the SPI flash should contain a known firmware, and there probably wouldn't be anything in the SD card socket. Uh, yeah, in the SD card slot. Not that we care about it. Right. So that that would, because there was a potentially no SD card, because you wouldn't actually need to boot up the firmware off it. That's all we're using it for in Slackware. So that those are the two scenarios I've got to handle. Um, so before we go further on that, so that's right, that those are the two, right? Yeah. yeah. There's two, okay. No, I couldn't think of any other scenarios that we need to handle. So the next thing, it would have done here is that if we go to the chat GPT directory. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, where's the thing gone? Uh, hold on. Where is it? Oh, here it is. Right. So if we uh, where are they? Oh, hang on, that's not right. Oh, that's a guide. That's not the so that's not the firmware is. Here we go. That's the firmware. I used that guide as well. Yeah, it's pretty good. It shows like different different distributions different ways of fixing things. OK, so these. So these are this is the directory um, from Solid Run. Solid Run is the vendor of this uh, piece of hardware. And this is their directory that contains all of their uh, firmware releases. Now, if you look, there's quite a number of them. However, um, and as Brent was saying, they are really now quite old. I mean, this they were last updated in 2021. Yeah, 2021. And we're now in the end of 2023. So these have been updated for a while. And to me, that means that either they don't, no one cares about it anymore, which is which is a possibility, um, and they're not putting resource on it, or that really they've kind of found most of the major issues and fixed them in the firmware, which is hopefully what the current status is, I don't know. But yeah. even though there's, there's quite a few here, um, there really aren't that many. Um, uh, well, actually, they, we need to, we've, I've missed a piece out here because in the honeycomb, for example, the RAM is a, a replaceable component. And in fact, you have to provide your own RAM, whereas on the Rock Pro 64, for example, and pretty much everything else, the RAM is soldered into the board. It's part, you know, it's part of the of the of the of the of the hardware, so it's, so it's it's non-replaceable, non-changeable. Whereas that's not the case with the Honeycomb LX2. So what that means is that you have to configure your hardware. So you have to configure your particular board with like dip switches and jumpers and stuff. You just it's just a dip switch. There's no nothing okay. else. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. 
Okay, so the hardware profile, for example, how to, you know, what the speed of your RAM is, what the speed of the, um, what are the other things that are in there? Uh, what's, what are the other things? So yeah, there's the speed of the system on chip, the speed of the bus, the speed of the RAM, and SIRDES, which I haven't found out what that means yet. It's so those- Network ports. Oh, is it? Yeah, the ah. fiber ports to configure ah. different ways. There's a way like you can make it into a switch or ah. you know, 100 gigabit or 10 gigabit times four, whatever you decide. Ah, okay. Okay. So, so basically, you've got to using dip switches. You have to uh, man, you know, uh, configure the hardware profile. Um, for your particular board, depending on how fast your RAM is and, and so on. And then what you do is you have to, the firmware that you boot has to uh, be configured statically to match the hardware profile. So if you look here, there are, there are loads of firmware, but actually there are only four hardware profiles. And, um, I'll show you what I mean by that in a sec. In fact, let's do it now. Going all over the place, but good for. So there are actually only four hardware profiles, which are these ones here. So uh, 2000 megahertz SOC speed, 700 megahertz bus speed, RAM speed 2400, and SIRDES they're all the same. So these are there, are, there are only four hardware profiles, but when you look at the website, there's absolutely loads of, of firmware. But the only difference is, is the build um, tag here, which is this um, uh, he some hex, it's a number in hex. I don't know what, what it is. I, don't know what I it think is. it's a git tag or oh, okay. commit well, number that, or something. Oh, that would make sense. Okay. So, so well, you could call it the build or the version of the build, we could say. Okay. So, and we in Slackware, we need to distribute two versions of the firmware. We need to distribute, we need to distribute this one which is the SD image. This is the image that you'll DD to your SD card that contains the, the firmware. So if, when you, in your first installation of Slackware, you'll boot the firmware off the SD card. So we need to provide this, so one of these, and we also need to provide a version of the firmware packaged for the SPI flash. So we can just take this image and dump it to the SPI flash and it will work. So we need to provide two images uh, for Slackware. But we need to provide two images for each um, hardware, for each of the four hardware profiles. So what I thought I did, what I thought I'd do is um, the, the first thing is, is I've written this script here and this downloads all of that stuff from the website. Ordinarily, you could use wget, but if you may, may have noticed when we loaded the website, it has some JavaScript stuff. And I was like, well, that didn't really work. So I just copied everything and pasted it into here. And then just so we've got a record of what we actually downloaded. And then it downloads it like that. Uh, then the there's a store firmware script because Obviously, I'm not. There's 157 megabytes of this firmware, and there's no way on earth we, we're shipping all of that. That's nuts. So, no. what I thought we'd do is, like you said earlier, this firmware hasn't changed in quite some time. So, I thought let's just pick the latest release and ship that. But the flashing tool that I'm, that I'm going to write also has to support multiple versions or multi, yeah, multiple builds of firmware for the set for um uh, for you know for one hardware model uh, sorry for one hardware profile so if you have uh you know say the say uh this one say this hardware profile here we may want to ship maybe two or three firmwares for it because my guess would be that um at some point somebody will say oh well you know this version of the firmware from like, you know, <laughs> January 2021 works works great with mine, but the latest version doesn't work properly on, you know, 57 boots out of 100, right? <laughs> and so what, the, the firmware flashing tool has to be able to support um, uh, us shipping more than one version of the firmware per profile to, to handle that use case, because otherwise 
uh, it'll be quite a limited tool. So I always like to sort of, uh, you know, add a little bit extra in there to make it easier in the future, because I'm certain that situation will happen where we need more than one version of the firmware. Yeah, probably for most people, the only thing that's going to change between the firmwares is the RAM speed. Uh, yes, that's right. But then, but for example, on that other page, which I've since closed. Um, you can't overclock the processor. I think it no, goes up to 2200. No, no, but I'm thinking about the in term, bug firmware and the uh, bugs in the firmware patches. Oh yeah, yeah. Because the, the, those guys that other um, that other website that I closed, they uh, had built their own firmware, and there was mention of patches and bug fixes and stuff like that. So you know, on I mean, at the, you know, I know you've looked into building the firmware, and it didn't didn't really work out well. But I I didn't to be to be honest, there's no. To me, there's no point in building our own firmware anyway when they haven't they, they haven't updated it. And until we find any problems for ourselves that other people have patched, which is not being maintained by anymore by Solid Run, you know, or rather Solid Run haven't addressed that and provided their own build, then we'll look at it then. But until then, we're just going to take what Solid Run have, ta have provided and assume that that's the best there is for their, their own hardware. <laughs> you kind of hope that that's how it is. So I what haven't I've done, really found any problems with it. I've tried all the different settings in the firmware. Uh, okay. It didn't like error out or anything. So. Yeah, then it's probably fine then. Okay. So what I've done here is um, I have uh, basically. So I've downloaded the other script, downloads all the firmware, and now we process it and store it. So what this bit of code does here, we I, I just thought let's just take the latest version of the firmware for each hardware profile. So the, the script figures out what the hardware profiles are. It just you know, which which is as you've seen, there's, there's only four of them. It figures out what they are dynamically, and then it just finds the most recent. Well, not there, it doesn't. Um, there it is. Then it finds the most recent recent version of each of those firmwares and stores them or moves them out of the way. And that little the trick here is a trick I use in all sorts of um, scripts uh, where um, you compare the timestamp of a file from the, um, or rather you, you, you look at the current time, the current system time against the birth of Unix in 1970. So basically, you get a, I think it's like, you think it's date percentage S or something like that. Have you have you, have you ever heard of this, Brent? Or you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, epoch time or whatever they, how e they say it. Yeah, the epoch time. So yeah. th this is the number of seconds since the birth of Unix, right? And it will, it will continue to increase. So what you can do is you can look at when a file was created relative to the Unix, the birth of Unix, and then you can just filter them out by that. It's quite a nice way of work of figuring out what um, when which files are newer than others, and um, you know when you're comparing files. So that's what I've done here. It's quite a nice trick. Yeah. To do. Been doing that for many. You don't years. have to worry about the system clock or anything. You just test that. Uh, well, it's right, still would be relative to the system. Oh, in this case, it would be yeah, it would be it's relative to the file rather than yeah. the system clock. So this is the timestamp of the of when the file was last modified, but in Unix time. In 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 yep. time, or the number of seconds since the birth of Unix, so it, it does. In this case, yes, it doesn't actually rely on the system clock at all. Yeah, um, good. So that, that's what that does. It moves it into place. A few other things. Um, the oh yeah, and then it moves the inside of this package, which is going to be a Slackware package. The only thing we're storing is the SPI firmware. So we're not packaging the SD card firmware because that doesn't make any sense. The SD card firmware is going to be here, which it already is actually. Uh, is it rescue recovery? I'd say. So yeah. the the SD card firmware is moved into place here, and you'll find this is already on the FTP site. Um, so it moves the latest version of the SD card firmware into here. We're not going to package that in Slackware because it doesn't make any sense to include it as a package. It's not, it's not part of Slackware. It's just something you use to bootstrap the installer. So that stuff stays out of the main tree. And then it creates sim links to the latest ver of the hardware profiles to the latest versions, so that in the installation guide you can just reference a static file name for the hardware profile. And if we ever do replace them, you don't you don't need to. If we ever 
replace, you know, upgrade or change the firmware itself, the, the actual file, then you, we don't need to change the documentation. So that does that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what else happens? And then once that's made those, those are, ah, yeah. So the next thing, now this is where I've kind of, I guess you could say over-engineered the whole thing, but <laughs> <laughs> these are these are like, these are the details that, that you know, I need to implement because they'll drive me crazy otherwise. And I'll show you what I mean in a minute. So because, so, okay, if you think about where we are now, so we've booted the, we've, we've put our SD card image, we've deployed our SD card image onto the SD card. We've booted, we've got the installer onto the USB stick and we've booted, uh, we turn the machine on, it's booted the firmware from the SD card, the Slackware installer is booted and we've installed the OS and now we need to write the firmware to the SPI flash so that you can dispense with, or, or, you know, we, you can, um, well, yeah, you can dispense with the SD card. Now, the thing is that we know that, well, well what we, when we look at the Rock Pro 64, one of the things that we can do is, uh, uh, okay. So on the Rock Pro 64, it's able to determine which version of U-Boot you are currently using. And it does that by just using, it just looks at the, the firmware binary, looking for particular, well, in fact, it looks for the, for the string U-Boot with Slackware at the, um, uh, uh, the, end, at the end of the string. And, and, it and then it just does some regexes to pull bits out of it. So we can determine which version of the bootloader we've got and then say, hey, actually, we have a different version on file. Would you like to use that instead? Um, and well, also in this bootloader flashing tool, we only supply one version of the bootloader because, well, yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to change the code to support more at this point. But it yeah. kind of makes sense just to have one that works. And actually, in, in the entire what, two, almost three years now, the same bootloader, no one's ever needed a different version of the bootloader for the Rock Pro 64 or Pineapple. No. So, um, yeah, so this one just supports one version, and but it is able to figure out which version of the firmware or bootloader you have. But the thing is, is that inside of the, um, this, well, basically, there's no such information inside of the, uh, uh, inside of the firmware for, for the Honeycomb LX2. So you, Brent, had a look and couldn't find anything useful in there that we could actually um, reliably match on and say, hey, yeah, this is the this particular build of the firmware versus another one. So that's just one way of doing it. So I thought, well, let's just implement it differently. So what we've done to be able to facilitate this is uh, for each of the firmwares, um, so that's all of them, not just the ones we're shipping, so if we have a look here, we're just shipping the latest version. So we've got one, two, three, four at the moment, right? Not just the versions we're shipping, but for every single firmware available from Solid Run, because somebody else could legitimately have gone to Solid Run's website and picked one of those instead if they wanted a particularly old version. So that would be an option for users. Um, but inside of Slackware, I just wanted to say, well, okay, how can I let, you know, how can I probe for what the hardware profile is? I don't care about the firmware version at the moment. I just care about what the hardware profile is, because um, you know you need to. We need to know what what the hardware profile is, so we can offer the fir the version of you know we can offer a firmware for or we can offer a, an appropriate firmware for the user to write. So what I've done is, are you following me? By the way, have I kind of like yeah, I am. Lost I am. You? <laughs> Good. <laughs> I never know because no, sometimes I'm here. just. Uh, I haven't explained this stuff before. I've just thought about it. So what we do here is I've checksummed the first 100K of each of the firmware for, from every bit of firmware um, from the website, both SPI and SD card. I've, I've uh, made a checksum of the first 100K of that firmware. It's pretty much an arbitrary number, actually, 100K. There's nothing special about it. Um, but the reason I've picked 100K rather than say the full size of the firmware is because lo um, loading data off of the SP uh, of the SPI flash is pretty slow actually. At least it is on the Rock Pro 64. So, and given that you can identify 
a file by probably the first like 50 bytes, you know, the, or even less actually, you can identify that this is a different file. You know, they're the same similar file names, but they're different files really easily. You don't need to read the whole thing. It's, it, for what we're doing here, it, it's enough to just pick a small amount. So I thought if I picked 100K, that will load really quickly off an SPI flash rather than eight megabytes, which is how large the firmware is. And it also creates excess wear on the SPI flash for no good reason. Yeah. So I picked a small amount, I could pick less, but we picked 100K and I've generated a checksum of everything, which is in here, right? So I've got each each file name and then a checksum of the first 100K. Um, I think that's all that does actually. Yeah, that's, that's what that does. And then it creates sim links for news. Okay, yeah. Okay, so that's what that does. So then, um, oh yeah, that's that spec, that's what I want. Okay, so we're gonna, so we're only gonna package the latest firmware, but we want to be able to support others. So what, we, what I thought I'd do is when the firmware tool, the flashing tool loads, it's going to check whether it can read the SPI flash. Oh, so actually, no, what that means is it's going to check whether it can read, it can just load anything or read anything in, off the SPI flash. So if the SPI flash is broken or it's absent for some reason, then um, uh, then it did. Oh, hold on. Actually, this is a good point. You know these these dip switches. The only thing they do is configure the boot order. It doesn't it doesn't mask the SPI flash or anything, right? No, it doesn't mask. You can you okay. can access all three from the OS once you're booted. Oh, okay. Because I think under Rock Pro sixty four, if you if you mask the SPI flash with the jumper, you can't. I don't think you can think MTD. You can't read it at all. I think it's simply not. There. Yeah, this isn't uh, shorting. It's just adjusting. Okay. It's just changing the boot order. Okay, that's yeah, fine. Yeah. Okay, good. So the first thing we'll do is check whether we can read the SPI flash, because if not, then there's no point in running the tool, is there? Because we're not gonna have to write anything <laughs> or read anything. So we bail out. Second thing is, um, yeah. So then if we can read the SPI flash, then we're going to read the first 100K of the SPI flash. And we're gonna compare that checksum. We're gonna search for that checksum within the, uh, the manifest. A uh, checksum. So we're going to we're going to look for that that firmware within the manifest. And if we do, then we can inform ourselves that hey, you know, if it's this checksum, then the profile is this RAM speeds two thousand uh, two thousand nine hundred megahertz. Right. So so this is this is the kind of you're probably thinking this is like over engineering. Why on earth is he doing that? <laughs> right. Well, what um, if they just decide to start updating it again? Then and you won't have an, you won't have over-engineered anything. So no, that's true. I know <laughs> that's true. Um, so then, uh, yeah. So if it can if it can read the SPI flash, then it will uh, compare that it will search for the checksum of the first hundred K within that manifest. If it can't, if it doesn't find anything inside of the SPI flash, then it will search the SD card because it should. This would be the situation where it's a brand new machine with empty SPI flash. So in this case, it will find a version of the firmware that you've downloaded from Slackware, which should be, which would be in this checksum file. And then it will know which, it will inform itself of which hardware profile you've got. Um, then, uh, yeah. And then when it's, if, if the script or the tool is operating with inside of the OS, i.e. not within the installer, then we'll only query the SPI flash because according to the doc, according to your install guide, you're supposed to write the firmware to the SPI flash. That's the supported approach. So within the OS, we don't, we're not gonna read the SD card. It has to be in the SPI flash. So we'll, we'll only query the SPI flash when we're trying to determine the hardware profile. Then what will happen is we'll decide whether to, um, uh, once we've determined, we haven't determined the SPI, um, the version, the hardware profile, the the user will then be offered whether to flash or not. So basically, the same as the um, hardware, as the Rock Pro, as the RK three three nine nine, where it will say, okay, the version of SPI flash you have, or version of firmware in SPI you have, is this is the one that we're shipping. I can find it on disk. It's the same one. You probably don't want to flash it, but if you do. Let me know. Press yes. So it gives you the option when it will default to no. 
Um, yeah, okay. Then if the, uh, at that point, the, 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 the reason why you'd want to reflash it would probably be because you're going to change the hardware profile or that we've shipped a new version of the firmware and you want to change it. Yeah. So uh, this is the point where we say, okay, if we've already determined the hardware profile, let's tell you what it is. So you've got it for reference. Um, but then also I need to drive the user through a menu structure where they select the hardware profile they want, then they pick the firmware object file that's on storage, and then they flash, finally flash it. So there's a bit of a user journey, um, there's a bit of structure there uh, to guide users through that, that process, that selection process. So um, if the, the idea is, is that if we can determine the hardware profile using the checksum, then we'll default the menu this is the over-engineering part, by the way. We'll default the menu to the one you've actually got. <laughs> and then, if not, then you just have to pick one out of the menu. <laughs> and then, and then it yeah. So basically what I've done is I've written a Slack build script. Well, I haven't. I copied the one from the, Rockpro the RK3399 and just, you know, made it just include all, just include all of the... Um, the uh, SPI firmwares, the four of the ones we're shipping. So I've done that, it's already installed. And in the sources directory, I've, I've started writing a the script. I've just, I'm just at the moment, just hacking the pieces together. Most of the code will come from the RK3333399 script because it's already been tested um, and it's mostly yeah. usable. Oh, by the way, on, on the reusability part of it, some of you, or maybe even you, might wonder why you know, if I'm going to be copying chunks of code from one script to another, why don't I just make a library like the ARM build system? And the reason yeah. is because that introduces another dependency to what is really quite a sort of basic package. I don't want, well, actually not basic, a core package. I don't want dependencies on a simple thing like this, which is a bootloader flash that once written is, but I'll probably never, the only thing we ever will ever change is probably simple cosmetic fixes or simple bug fixes, and then mostly just changing the firmware. So the script is never going to be, you know, it's not like it's a major piece of work, ongoing piece of work. And I think probably the other reason would be if you overclock the processor and you've rebuilt the firmware for yourself, but um, then you got to install liquid cooling and all this crap. So that's why I, um, I just went with a fan and I don't overclock. Okay. Well, they, yeah, that, yes, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, the, uh, but yeah, but the, the reason on the, on the, on the dependencies is because basically I don't want a package like this depending on another package. And then what, what are the package? Where am I going to put this script? Where am I going to put this? Where am I going to put this library? Am I going to create another package that just that contains a single library? I'm not going to do that. Like in the case of the SLK HWM, um, <laughs> this one in the case of this one this one lives in the um in the kernel package even though it's not it's not entirely kernel but it kind of it kind of is and it seemed like the best place to put it rather than making yet another package that just contains core components of of the package of the of the os so yeah so that's why so it's easier just to copy paste the code uh, than it is to um, create a dependency. So, so that's what, so most of this code will come from there. But basically, um, at the moment, I've just been hacking this stuff together uh, to create to to figure out the checksumming and create the workflow. So I'll show you what I've done. So basically, if we run this at the moment, it's detected the or is it, it's dynamically determined what the hardware profiles are by looking at the files that are in, in user share, HWM, BW, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's, look, it's queried the existing set of firmware and determined that there are four hardware profiles. And then it's offering you, in this case, if you, if you look, as you may have noticed, it's defaulted to the third option here, right? So defaulted to that because this is what it discovered looking at the hardware. Now, obviously I haven't discovered looking at the hardware. I've just hard coded the, um, the thing at the moment, but, <laughs> this is what it would have done. So, um, so it's a basically this is the over-engineering bit. Is that I actually want it to just default to the current one. 
<laughs> it's quite a bit of extra work, I must admit, to to make it work. But I really these are the things I really like. I like these kind of I like these little touches where, you know, it just saves you one like two extra presses on the keyboard. Yeah. One of those things. So what you'll do is um, <laughs> it'll have a screen which like the next one. So this is the screen you'll initially get, similar to the RK33399. And it will tell you what the current installed firmware is. So it'll tell you the file name if it's, it will just tell you the file name. And then it tells you the details about it. So the SOC speed, blah, blah, blah. And then if it's if it's the same as the version that we, you know, if, if it's the same as the version we have um, in the package, then it will just say, hey, you don't need to upgrade, but you can if you want, or no. So this is just, I was just building out the um just getting all of this stuff working and um, and then once yeah. i'm done with that oh there you do want to yeah i need to resize it so then once you're done with that then um uh, then it would then it would flash so yeah that's basically what i've done there uh which so it's funny so uh yeah so <laughs> one of the things I, I wanted to do i thought to myself um how can i extract the components from the file name right so you saw the file name this is this but with dot image on the end how can i extract the the various elements of this string into separate um uh variables and I, it's easy enough to do i could just use cut and stuff orc and stuff like that but i thought to myself i don't really want to do that i want to see if there's a better way of doing it and i could i thought about using said and i was like oh you know what what does chat gpt tell me so <laughs> So what, what happened was, so here's what I put into. Wish I had looked into that before. So yeah. I thought, what, what can chat GPT do here? Just let's just throw something to it. So I, I basically provided it a homework assignment and I said, uh, in the Linux shell, I want to take the following file name. There's the file name, and I want the following the following variables to be set based on the file name. They're not static. The solution must support all file names. And I just put here's what I want to see basically. So it comes back with this this here, and it works. And it's not how I was going to do it. And I thought oh, I quite like this. So I took that code, and that's going to be here. Um, this is going to be checking. Uh, uh, yeah, basically this is just, so th this code will be used to determine the hardware profile and, and do a file check and some other stuff like that. This is just code sitting in the script at the moment. It's not, it's all ready to start, you know, for me to start building out. But I took that, so I thought, oh, that's cool. That works. So then I thought to myself, I thought I'd say, I'd ask it, what's the, the most computationally efficient solution to set those variables based on the file name? And it came back with this here. And I thought, OK, I thought, oh, OK, it's a different way of doing it. I'm, I'm not really sure how it thinks that it's the most computationally efficient method. Does it, has it analyzed the bash source code and determined that this would be the most expedient method? It certainly hasn't done the script, I can tell you that much. So I don't know yeah. how it knows it can't like test the hard drive or anything so for like io but, well there wouldn't be any I, any io in this case because it's all just in ram well it would be yeah. like ram but you wouldn't have but i mean this literally just string passing really reading strings so i don't know how it would know that that's faster or more computationally efficient but i thought okay well actually i prefer this one because i want the if statement mm -hmm. as it happens <laughs> this is actually going to become more code uh but if this way around i can verify that the that every you know that the File name is of the correct format, which it should be because it's in a it's in it's in a checksum. But let's verify it anyway, and then I can set the variables accordingly and then use them for searching and stuff like that. So I asked it that, but then oh um, <laughs> then I tried to ask it. In fact, did I ask it exactly the same thing? No. So then I I, I wanted to. Um, just exper experiment a little more. And I removed the word computa um, most computationally efficient, or whatever I said. And it came back with uh, this instead. And so here it's changing the, the file name. And it's like, 
it's really interesting because all of this stuff works. I was, I was becoming quite interested and curious as to what different options would it provide me? But then I tried to ask it the same question, the same initial question, and it would never again provide the original answer, which is the one I preferred. I don't know if it's because I'm sort of training it by keeping asking different questions or what. I guess perhaps if I sort of cleared everything and maybe it would give me the same thing. I don't know. But I was like, this saved me a whole bunch of time and the code's better than what I was going to to use, I think. Because um, sometimes, you know, I just think, oh, if I can't think how to do this with the regex, I'll just do plain old cut, pipe, rev, all sorts of stuff just because it's easy. Yeah. I do a proper old school Unix way. But if, if possible, I prefer to use the functionality of the shell, um, which incidentally, this is why I have a, if anybody's still with us at this point, you never know, is that if you are, this, if you're interested in learning the Bash shell, this is, this book is really good. I've got this book. I've, I've looked, it. I used it yeah. for reference. Um, it's worth having a, a good read of that. So, uh, where are we? It's a good book. Yes. So, yeah, so that's, that's what, that's what we've done there. Um, and actually, I'm going to see what else I can get chat GPT to do for me. Um, <laughs> see what other parts of the script I can get it to write. Um, I can't at the moment. I can probably just write it without any help at all now because I've got all of this stuff done. But um, yeah, so so I've got, I've we've we've got the code here to determine what the hardware profile is by examining the strings. And then this part here. Oh, my goodness. I spent about an hour getting this working because you can't you, you <laughs> trying to create so basically i wanted i wanted the the menu you know the the, the hardware profiles to be a sta uh, to be a dynamic list right and so you'd think you could just you know call dialog and get this function to respond with the menu choices which is what it does do but you can't just do that so i was like okay well let me I look to see how other people, basically you can, but it's all mangled. All of the, if, if, if I get it to output, like um, say, where is it? Oh yeah, here we go. So if I, if I, for example, to get it to do this. So this is what that, that function output is, right? And this is supposed to be, this is the tag for the menu, which is actually, which is disabled here. I don't want that tag in the menu. I only want the, I only want the description. So this is the tag and this is the description that you saw. So that's all this output. And I thought that you could, you know, just make dialogue consume that output and it would just work. It doesn't work at all. It's all, everything's mangled. So then I thought, okay, let's see if I could do, um, do I still have a code? Oh, I deleted it. Cats, uh, EOF, bash. <laughs> and then I put EOF at the end here, which is there. Oh, we still have it there, actually. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Get rid of that. So th I did that. And that worked but then the um then the i couldn't capture what the user had chosen from the menu so then i was like how am i going to do that and then i realized oh i can probably just change the file descriptors around i've done this before when in, in some sort of automated scripts i used to so i looked at some really old scripts and i was like oh yeah okay so i can just uh, switch around the file descriptors and then that way i'll be able to capture the output so Prior to this, I'd Googled how to how other people were doing this and found that people were using this complicated, well, it's not complicated, but this particular st array structure, which Dialog accepts. And I was like, but I don't, I, I tried to get that to work and I got the example to work, but then I couldn't hide the menu, the item. I was like, oh. so this is ridiculous. I don't want an array. So then I thought, okay, let's just, let's just go back to this. I managed to get this working. So I'm di now dynamically creating um, dialogue menus with, with, uh, um, and capturing the output with no temporary files in sight and no arrays. So much easier. <laughs> Tell me about an hour to get that too. working. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, that's that's basically, this is when I said uh, an IRC, I said the hard stuff is done. This is the hard stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Everything else is basically copying from the other script and just getting the workflow working. Yeah, the firmware for the Honeycomb is actually open source. Uh, EFI firmware, so it's you can find it in like I think OpenBSD uses it for some machines and oh okay you know, so it's it's pretty open good okay all right 
And um, yeah, perhaps in the next video, I'll uh, have uh, made progress on this bootloader flashing tool. And we'll be one step closer to a fully documented, fully um, supported uh, hardware model. Good to talk to you, Brent. And we'll see you in the next yeah. one. Talk to you later. See you later. Bye. All right, bye.